Good morning, everyone. What's the day today? Is it the 20th? Monday? Someone say Monday. <laughs> I'd almost buy that. Uh, I think today, is today the first day of spring, the 20th? Yeah. Congratulations, we made it. Winter's over. The, the original reason I asked uh, what the date was is because I was supposed to preach this sermon two weeks ago. We had an ice storm, and then I was supposed to preach it last week, uh, but I, it, I somehow caught the plague and wasn't able to be here. Um, so this morning is the morning. So this sermon's been cooking for like three weeks. Uh, so it might be a little overdone. We might really have to chew on it pretty hard, but... Uh, Why don't you join me as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we commit this morning to you. We commit our lives to you. We pray that you'd be pleased um, with our hearts this morning. I pray that we would open them to your word and that we would just make that commitment right now that we're going to obey what you tell us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our sermon series uh, entitled Closing Crescendo, and we're going to be in John 14, 15 through 31. So if you would open up your Bibles, it's a long passage. Um, We're going to be in there this morning. Keep your finger in there because we're going to be in there quite a bit this morning. While you're turning there, I want you to ask yourself this question. Have you ever found yourself repeating things? Like repeating yourself. I remember back a couple years ago when I was a youth pastor feeling like I'm repeating myself to these kids all the time. I remember when we had preschool aged children. You just feel like all the time you're repeating yourself. Like, don't put that in your mouth. Don't take that out of the dog's mouth and put it in your mouth. You're just repeating these things over and over and over again. Maybe you have junior high age children. Maybe you have a husband and you have to repeat things over and over and over again. I often wondered as a youth pastor how many times I could consecutively give the same lesson before the kids would notice. Like, could I come back three weeks, maybe four weeks, same message, change the PowerPoint a little bit, but would they would they notice? If you find yourself repeating things over and over again, fear not. You're in good company because in this passage this morning, we're going to see that Jesus does the same thing. People repeat themselves for various reasons. Teachers, parents, wives, they all do it because they know that their audience isn't really listening. Raise your hand if you've heard the phrase, repetition is the key to learning, right? A lot of you educators out there, I'm sure, have heard that. Um, A lot of you kids out there have heard that. Repetition is the key to learning, and it's true. People rarely capture the entirety of what you're trying to communicate to them the first time around. Various experts say you need to hear something between seven and 30 times in order to commit it to memory. I'm only going to preach this sermon once this morning, so you don't have to worry about, you know, seven times. In this morning's passage, I want you to pay particular attention to the times that Jesus repeats himself. Ask yourself, what is he trying to say to the disciples, and what's he trying to say to me? Why would Jesus go to the trouble of repeating himself? So we're in John 14. I'm going to start in verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, excuse me, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, You know him, for he dwells with you and will be 
in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he will love, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 22, Judas, not the bad Judas. Judas said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home and and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you, before it takes, let me start over. And now I have told you, before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. All right, so we're going to put on our Bible scholar hats this morning, and we're going to discover together what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. We're going to discover together what Jesus is trying to tell us. The first thing that I think Jesus is trying to get across to us is, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Did you notice this theme repeating itself throughout the passage? If you love me, you will keep my commands. Have you ever met someone who was so kind, so thoughtful, so encouraging, and you wonder, I wonder if they're a Christian. I wonder if they're a believer. Or maybe you've met someone who claims to be a Christian, but based on their behavior and their disposition, you really wonder, how is that possible? Jesus is telling his disciples here that if you love me, you'll do what I told you to do. You will live how I want you to live. Now, practically speaking, how do we do this? How do we live in a manner that honors Christ? I love Jesus. But, do I always hit a home run? Do I always please him? Do I always honor him? Or do I sometimes act sinfully? I drop the ball. I make mistakes. I choose to sin. Does that mean I don't love God? If you know Jesus, then you understand that life is a wrestling match, right? We've got one foot in heaven, our citizenship is there, but as we look around, we're all still here on earth. So there's a struggle, right? I've been commanded to honor Jesus, to love him, and to do what he's told me to do, and yet, every day, I sin. Every day, I let him down. Every day, I choose to rebel some way, somehow. How is that? Why is that? Well, each one of us was born a sinner. We're born with a sin nature. We are predisposed 
to sin. I, I have four kids. I remember uh, when each one of them was born. And there's these little babies that are like so perfect. And I remember looking at them and thinking, they're perfect. Or so I thought. I don't know what Jessica was doing with them while I was at work, but I know I didn't teach them to sin, right? And I don't think that Jessica did either, but somehow, somehow, they figured it out, how to sin. It's because they were born that way. They were born with a sin nature. Some people will tell you that you know, we're, people are generally good, right? People are generally kind. The Bible disagrees with those people. It's up on the screen. Psalm 51, 5 says this. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. We're all born sinful. We're all born wicked. It's passed down from Adam. And Jesus knows this about us because he created us, right? He was there when Adam sinned in the garden, and he understands the consequences of that sin that each one of us now, if we know Christ, have one foot in heaven, our citizenship is there, but we also have one foot here on earth. We still have that sin nature. And it's a battle back and forth. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you love me, you're going to fight. If you love me, you're going to struggle. Jesus says we must be born again. We've all heard that phrase. And the phrase comes from John 3, verses 3 through 6. Jesus is talking with a man named Nicodemus, and he says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born Sounds traumatic for everyone involved, right? But it's a natural question. Nicodemus is like, okay, Jesus, what are you talking about? How can we be born again? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Everything changes when you're born again. We go from living sinfully according to our flesh without choice, right? We're naturally going to choose sin because that's how we were born. We have that hardwired into us. But once we're born in the Spirit, once we commit our lives to Jesus and His Spirit comes and lives within us, now we have a choice. We don't have to choose sin. We can choose to honor Christ. We can choose to obey him. That's how we show our love for him. Do you remember what Jesus said in our passage? Verse 15, we're back in John 14. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive... Because it, is either, it, is neither, it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus, before Jesus came, the Holy Spirit would come and go, right? In the Old Testament, we see King David. He begs God not to let his spirit depart from him. So the Holy Spirit wasn't a permanent indwelling 
in the Old Testament before Jesus came. Now, Jesus is promising that the Holy Spirit will be with you forever, all the time, everywhere you go, whatever you do. Jesus promises that the Spirit will be your permanent companion. Because of that, we see, number two, we are not alone. Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years. He faced every manner of temptation that we face. He had friends die young. He faced rejection. He was taken advantage of. He was abused. He was mistreated. He knew firsthand what we all know. That life is hard. You agree with that? Life is hard. Because of that, look what Jesus says in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. The life of an orphan is pretty difficult, both physically and emotionally. And when Jesus starts telling the disciples, I'm going to leave you. In a little while, I'm going to leave you. I'm not going to be here forever. Naturally, they start to panic. In this passage, Jesus is reassuring them. He's saying, you will not be alone. When I leave, I will be with you all the time through the Holy Spirit. Not for a limited time only, like David dealt with in the Old Testament, but I'll be with you permanently the whole time. From that moment you put your faith in Christ, I'll be with you. You notice Jesus is using the tool of repetition. What does he say again in verse 21? Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. God will show himself to those who keep his commandments. Jesus is telling them, I understand your biggest fear is life without me. But if you love me, if you keep my commandments, then you will see my Father. You will be in relationship with all three persons of the Trinity. Judas, not the Judas who betrayed Jesus, scholars agree pretty much that this Judas is the half-brother of Jesus. He asks a pretty obvious question. He says, if you leave, like you say you're going to leave, how are we going to see you? Jesus says in verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my, father's, and my father will love him, and will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. What does he start with? What does Jesus start with? What's the repetition? What does Jesus keep telling us? If you love me, keep my word. My Father will love you. We will make our home with you. The Spirit living in us and our keeping the commands of God are the identifiers that we have as believers. These are the things that people use to identify you as a believer. Are you living in the Spirit? Do you obey God? When people look at you, do they see a family resemblance? Do they say, this person's been with Jesus? Or do they wonder, how can this person be a Christ follower? How can they be a Christian? When they look at our interactions online with people who disagree with us, do they wonder, is that how Jesus would respond?
Jesus knew that life was hard. He knew that we would be tempted to sin. But we're not orphans. We don't have to provide for ourselves. We're not responsible for our own protection. We have a Father who loves us, who freely gives us all things. Do we live our lives like that? Or do we live in fear? Do we wonder, does God love me? The third thing that I think Jesus really wants us to understand is found, uh, let's see. Well, we'll get to it. The third thing that Jesus wants us to remember is let not your hearts be troubled. Starting in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Not at, now, let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may, be believe, you may believe. While I am still with you, Jesus is implying his physical presence with them is not permanent. He keeps repeating himself. It's like the disciples are cramming for a test. And if it feels like they're cramming for a test, it's because they are. The test is life without the physical presence of Jesus. He's been teaching them for three years. Now it's time for Jesus to go back and the disciples are going to be pushed out of the nest. In verse 26, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper. The Spirit helps us keep the commands of Jesus. He reminds us of how to live when we get distracted, when we get overwhelmed. The Spirit helps us just like the GPS on my phone, right? My phone's always telling me, return to the route, recalculating, finding another way, Return to the route. She never gets, like, angry at me. She never gets, like, frustrated with me, like, hey, dummy, you're still lost. Return to the route. The Holy Spirit is like that in our lives. Do you remember we have one foot in heaven, one foot here on earth. The Holy Spirit is consistently telling us to return to the route. We get distracted by that one foot that's here on earth. We have to choose between loving God and obeying Him or obeying the sin nature that we were born with. The Spirit is here to help us recalculate. The Spirit is here to help us to return to the route. Again, in verse 27, Jesus repeats himself. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. Do, not, do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Repeat that. I want you guys to repeat after me. Let not your hearts be troubled. We heard that a couple weeks ago in Pastor Jordan's sermon. John 14, 1, Jesus repeats himself, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is telling us, I created you. 
I lived on earth for 33 years. I know every detail of history and every detail of the future. You are going to freak out. You're going to panic. You're going to have circumstances in life that overwhelm you. And you're not going to know what to do next. In 2020, a pandemic's coming. And it's going to change your life. He knows every detail of your life. Every diagnosis you'll get. Every financial hardship that will happen. Every relationship that fails. Every time you're rejected, you're let down, you're hurt, you're misused. When your career goes backwards instead of forwards, or it goes sideways. Jesus is telling you, let not your hearts be troubled. How can he tell us that? The beginning of verse 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus said, in those moments, I give you peace. Take a breath. Remember who's in control. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do you realize the reason I had you repeat that is because I want you to remember it. Fear is a choice. Fear is a choice. I'm sure it's common in a lot of households for siblings and spouses to like jump out of closets and scare each other. That happens pretty regularly at our house. Sawyer especially loves to scare people. Especially, it's really funny when Jessica's in the morning making her coffee and like he comes around the corner like a cartoon character and you know, I have a choice at that point. I can warn her or I can watch the show unfold. In that moment, she doesn't have a choice to be scared, right? She's going to jump. But in the circumstances of life, Jesus tells us, you have a choice. You don't have to choose fear. You don't have to be anxious. I'm going to be vulnerable with you this morning. I've struggled with anxiety before. It's not fun. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that feeling and it can be overwhelming. <clears throat> it can be more than just a feeling. It can be a season in life where you're anxious and you're worked up and it just never goes away. It's like a baseline always like when's the other shoe going to fall? The world may not tell you that's a choice but the person who created you Jesus is telling you anxiety is a choice. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell you, don't let your hearts be troubled. He wouldn't tell you, fear not. We have a choice. Sometimes, especially when I was a kid, I would get really worked up about things. My dad worked third shift for part of my childhood. And when he was gone at night, it would really bother me. What if something happened while dad's gone? He's not here to handle it. Which, it me which means in some capacity, in some way, I have to handle it. And I'm only 10. Like, how am I going to handle it? Every kid thinks that their dad is like the toughest guy in the world, right? I was no different. I thought my dad could handle anything. But I knew as a 10-year-old, I can't handle anything. I can't handle everything. When my dad was home and 
it was time to go to bed, I didn't think twice about it. I wasn't afraid of the dark. I wasn't afraid of what went bump in the night. I was confident because my dad's close by. He's right there. But when he wasn't there, I was afraid. Jesus is telling us, don't be afraid. I am with you. I'm with you. Just like my dad was sleeping upstairs, I was sleeping downstairs. If something happened, I knew he'd handle it. Jesus is saying, if you love me, my Father and I, through the Spirit, are going to make our home with you. I'm going to dwell in and with you. Jesus is telling us, don't be afraid, because no matter what it is, I can handle it. You have nothing to fear because Jesus is here. You can choose to be courageous. You can choose to reject fear. Now, I've lived it. I'm not saying it's easy to do that. In fact, it's difficult to do it. But it's not impossible. Because Jesus is with you. That's not just something you put on a coffee cup. You can take that to the bank. The Spirit of God is in you. If you have repented of your sin, if you've turned your life over to Jesus, the Spirit of God is in you, and you can choose to be courageous. Verse 30 for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on me. Jesus is saying, I've already won. Satan has lost. He can't touch me. And if he can't touch me, he can't touch you. Satan has no claim on you either. You have nothing to fear. You are not an orphan. When you get that diagnosis, when the check bounces, when the relationship ends, when it doesn't work out, you don't have to be afraid because you're not alone. So as we wrap this up this morning, there's five things I want us to remember. Number one, if you're in the habit of repeating yourself, it's okay. You're in good company. I repeat myself. Jesus repeats himself. It's how we learn. Number two, if you love Jesus, you will keep his commands. There's no wiggle room. He repeated it like a hundred times in this passage. There's no wiggle room. You can't tell people that you love Jesus and misuse the people around you. It doesn't compute. You can't tell people you love Jesus and cheat. It doesn't compute. It doesn't add up. Jesus has laid out the equation for us. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Number three, when life is hard, when life is scary, when life is boring, when life is easy, when life is happy or fantastic or going great, it's 50 degrees out and it's going to feel like 70, or next week when we get a foot of snow, no matter what's happening, what your circumstances are, you're not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to go through it alone. The Spirit is with you at all times. You don't have to beg like David, King David begged, for his Spirit to remain. It's permanent. Jesus promises us that truth right here in chapter 14. Number four, 
Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is telling you, it's a choice. You don't have to panic. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to let it control you. Let not your hearts be troubled. And lastly, it's like the old days. Remember I used to give you memory verses? I want you to memorize John 14, 23. As we learned earlier, if you repeat it between 7 and 30 times, it should be simple to memorize this verse. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. It's, it's, not, it's not a very long verse. It's pretty easy. John 14, 23. Okay? Now, how many of you were in maybe Pioneer Clubs or Awana, you were in some type of children's programming where if you memorized a verse, you got a treat. You remember that? Okay? How many of you missed those days? Right? Like, I would like a treat. I do not care how old you are, whether you are just barely talking or super old. Next week... If you come up to me and you can tell me this verse, I'm going to have a treat for you. Okay? So, John 14, 23. Okay? Now, depending on your age, just because you walk up to me and start talking doesn't mean you're getting the treat. Okay? I will be more gracious with those on the younger spectrum when they do their memory verse. And those on the older spectrum, well, I'll also be gracious to them. But for us in the middle, you're going to have to probably have it word for word in order to get the treat. But it's going to be worth it, okay? Scripture memory is important, folks. It really is. Because you can't always rip your Bible out and look something up when life happens. The Spirit's living in you and he takes those verses that you've memorized when life is scary and he brings them to mind. But we have to memorize them, all right? That's the real treat. The real treat is the word is living in you. But there will also be a sugary treat for you if you can remember. So I expect you to form an orderly line next week and we will do this scripture memory together. I love you guys. I love this congregation. I hope that that shines through this morning. I want to see us choose faith over fear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this congregation. I thank you for these people. I thank you for your great love for us. Thank you so much for not leaving us as orphans. You're with us every step of the way. When we fail, you're there to to Help us recalculate to return to the route. And Father, when things go well, you're there also, proud of us. I pray that we would always remember that you're there with us, no matter what we face. And I pray that our love for you would be our calling card, that people would know us by our love for you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this reminder. Thank you for your grace. Most importantly, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.